We're on schedule to take a trip to meet a well-known broadcast journalist just north of the city. My name is Soledad O'Brien, and this is uh, my house. We live in Dutchess County with uh, four kids and my husband. Normally, we would live in New York City, but since the pandemic, like a lot of New Yorkers, we kind of decamped and were able to uh, come out here. We love to consider it either the middle of nowhere <laughs> or on a really nice day. Uh, it's got a little touch of paradise in it. I run a production company called Soledad O'Brien Productions, and we mostly um, produce television shows. And then I anchor Matter of Fact. I'm Soledad O'Brien. Welcome to Matter of Fact. And I'm a correspondent for HBO's Real Sports, which is one of my favorite shows, maybe my favorite show. Climatization, how students or athletes generally get used to the temperature, really depends on where you are. Good girl. Can you high five? Oh, you're so smart. I don't collect things because I think they have monetary value. They have to spark a little joy in me. That's it, that is my bar. It just has to be something that I find appealing. I like art that makes you happy. I like objects that tell a great story. I don't know anything about antiques, so I'm excited to have someone who can say, this has no value, this has some value, this, we don't even know what this is. Um, but I, I'm curious about a couple of things. Roadshow loves a curious collector. And here to explore Soledad's questions are Roadshow appraisers Benny Rea and David Walker. Hi, Benny. When I was uh, shooting in, um, in the Congo, uh, we were doing a series there for PBS. I found these beautiful masks and, and wood sculptures, and uh, there was no way to get them back on a plane. And so I paid a guy on the street and, and gave him my address. <laughs> and he literally wrapped them in bubble wrap and put them in the mail. And they arrived like six months later. And I love them. They remind me a lot of a, of a trip that was a great trip for us. Um, but also I think they're very beautiful. Both of the pieces are Congolese, but they're made by two different tribes. The mask is made by the Kuba, and the standing figure is probably made by the Bena Lalua people. The problem with both of these pieces is that they were made for resale. The, the, the great differentiation in African tribal art is whether or not the object was made for ritual use or if it was made for resale. It's designed as if it's for ritual use, but really only to sell to tourists. That's right. <laughs> so the mask is in the style of a Kuba complex mask, but it was made for, for resale. And obviously the, the same goes for the Bena Lalua figure. The Lalua people are very well known for their figures. We know that this isn't made for ritual use because it's very, very large, number one. Usually the ones that are known to be for ritual use are, are much smaller. And it doesn't have any arms, so that's another giveaway. But one of the reasons why we do know it's, it's probably made by the Lalua is because it has this scarification all over mm. it. If I was to give a value, it would probably be at auction somewhere between 150 and $300 a piece, which is... Yeah, and probably what I paid for them, I would guess. And I think also, and then to repair them was more. <laughs> yeah. I would never sell them in a million years. And also, I don't think anybody would care about the backstory like I would. That's the first thing you want to... There's more from Soledad's house when she learns another backstory. It weighs 10 million pounds. It is so heavy. Next stop, Pauling, New York, where Soledad O'Brien has some questions about a special table. We have a, a lithographer's table, is what I was told it was. It's just this massive table. So I'm interested to find out, is it a lithographer's table? How was it used and how old is it? Tell me where you acquired to the table. The table I bought at a store in New York City. I was living in a loft and I needed a piece that was just bigger. Every little table I had just wasn't going to work right. in a big loft. Yeah. And so uh, my husband and I went in and we saw that table and we loved it and we bought it. I guess for like 500 bucks, 600 bucks maybe. The guy uh, who sold it to us said that it was a lithographer's table from the 1800s. Right. Then we tried to move it. It weighs 10 million pounds, it is so heavy. Each time you move it, it requires six massive dudes. Gosh. I think it's because there's a thing of marble, which mm. must be this big, it is mm -hmm. so heavy. It is a lithographer's table. And the stone is what gives it away. It's a limestone slab. Oh, it's not marble. Marble would be too soft for what its function is. 
it would be used to make prints on. The process of lithography is essentially engraving on stone. So there's probably been dozens and hundreds of artworks that have been made on your table. And the company which I think made that table was, was Hamilton. And Hamilton was really, really famous. It was an American company from Wisconsin. I don't think it's as early as the 19th century. I think it's probably made in the early 20th century. You've got like this really, really thick apron. It's built to carry a lot of weight on the top. And also, if you look at the legs, they're united by this stretch of this box stretcher that goes all the way around because it has to be really strongly constructed just to support that weight on the tops. I think it's a very, very good look. It has this sort of industrial chic, which I think is probably what drew you to it in the first place for your loft. I think that it was probably worth somewhere at auction between two and three thousand. I think uh, if you're going to... And then another 10,000 to get someone to move it because <laughs> <laughs> it's so heavy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, retail, I mean, I think you could ask eight or 9,000 for it would be a fair asking price. So, you know, I think it, for $500, it seems like it was really well bought. Yeah, we're never moving it again. It stays right there for the rest of my life. Yeah. But it's good to know that it has some, some value to it. We're rolling back to Soledad O'Brien's where appraiser Bene Rea is looking over some controversial pieces. We have these little figurines. I don't even know what I would call them. Some of them are little banks, so they have a clear use, but others, I couldn't even tell you what they are. When were they created and why? Was it something disrespectful or is it something that was done in a positive way? I, I know so little about it that I'm very interested in just hearing a little bit more. How did you come to own all of these figures? <laughs> it's a little bit of a crazy story. I live in New York City, usually, and I was walking down the street with uh, the guy who runs a show that I do. His name is Emerson. And he, he is the one who really noticed that there was a, like a guy on the street with a little table set up selling these figurines, but a bunch of other random things. And Emerson and I, he's black, yeah. I'm black, we looked at each other like, oh, we need to buy these. Both of us knew we didn't want them in anybody else's hands. Why? I'm a little protective of them. I don't want to leave them on the street for just anybody to grab them and use them in ways that don't honor, if that's the right word, what the backstory is. And I don't know if there's any value in it. I think I paid like $9 for the big ones wow. and $5 for the little ones. My goal was to grab them off the street okay. and put them in a box and bring yeah. them home and come up with a strategy <laughs> about how we, we feel about them and, yeah. and what we need to do with them. When you saw them, did you know about these kinds of figures at all? No, none, nothing. No. They're painted cast iron banks. These are mechanical banks. These are steel banks. Mm. The history of these kind of figures were they were made after the Civil War because there was a lot of people who were angry about the freedoms that the slaves received. And they wanted to demean the black people by making these kind of caricatures of their features. That's why the lips of these kinds of figures are very red and very prominent, and they're using stereotypes like the watermelon to put down the black people. That's originally why they were made. Actually, these two over here, these are mechanical banks. You put a penny here and you press this lever, and this kind of bank was marketed towards children. That's how ingrained it was that even your children could make fun of black people. All these people who've now been freed from the Civil War, and yet they have a tremendous obstacle to overcome, and they're only in subservient jobs, right? Exactly. The classic yeah. mammy kind of role. Yeah. And now, and now being mocked, mm -hmm. essentially, for being the underclass. So how do we think about displaying it, putting it somewhere, in a way that does justice to its history. Yes. I'm not sure like the answer to, to uncomfortable history is wrap it all up, um, stuff it under the bed, and yes. don't let anybody talk about it. I totally it. agree with you. I don't think they should be put away because this is history. This happened. This was made for a reason, and people should know why it happened. Even though they're offensive, these types of figures are still made today. Most of yours are likely newer pieces modeled after earlier toys, but made to look old. This figure over here, you notice, looks has an overall wear, mm -hmm. and it is way too uniform. Things don't age this way. Oh. This one looks like it was buried in, this, in the backyard. Just to, to make them look older? Exactly. <laughs> there is a group of people who romanticize that era, and they are the ones who would buy these. But other people buy it for different reasons. A lot of black collectors, a lot of African-American collectors buy up 
all of these figures because they didn't want it out in the public. Yes. Well, we did that. We took every yes. single one. Exactly. <laughs> as far as value goes, contemporary pieces like these can sell for under $100 each. 19th and early 20th century ones can sell for over $100. I like knowing the backstory on it. I think it's an interesting and, and sometimes uncomfortable history, so I, uh, yes. I'm glad to know it. And now at least yes. I can make a, a thoughtful decision about exactly. how, we'll, how we'll display them somewhere. Yes, display them and talk about them. Yeah. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I was so happy to learn more about these figurines. I feel like my instinct about grabbing them <laughs> and taking them all uh, was a good one. And now, of course, uh, I think I have to figure out how to display them. The history in some ways is, is bad, right? It's, it's, it's offensive. But also understanding that they have some value to people trying to claim them back is kind of cool. The table, I do love that it has a great backstory, and I love that it's centered around art and people just working at it, right? It's a useful, it's a useful table. So that, that's pretty great. And certainly for the mass, I wouldn't change anything. It was a fantastic trip. I love the backstory of the things that I own, and I think they make my home and my space personal to me. I like things with a story. I like being able to say, oh, well, you know where I got that? That, to me, is the value of an object. Interestingly, yours is, is sort of coloured white, uh, which, you know, it might be tempting to think that that has a symbolism as well, you know, so white, white and various... Oh, sorry. You have lost your mind, Coco. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly someone disagrees with me. <laughs> Come sit. Lie down. Lie down. Good girl. We are in the middle of something important, and you have to be a good interview dog. Good girl. <laughs> <laughs>